Hey, Goat Knucklers. Welcome back to Goat Knuckle Talk with Flo. I am Flo. Before I introduce my co-host and our guest, remember, if you're, once you're on our YouTube channel, please subscribe to the channel, like uh, the video, and also uh, you know post any comments. So we'll really appreciate it. So back from Chile, three weeks vacation is uh, Lisa Nolan Hafner. Welcome back to the States and, of course, our show. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. It was an exciting and really busy trip, and I'm glad I came home in one piece. We're glad you're here. <laughs> a separate show so I can talk about our, our adventures and, you know, getting tear gassed in Santiago. But anyway, that's for another time. Anyway, welcome, everyone. And we have a special guest tonight, Mr. Curtis Peoples, class of 85. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Yay. Welcome, Mr. Peoples, or should I say Dr. Peoples? You can if you would like. That's Curtis pretty that's like pretty it. awesome. That's pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. So where are you living now, Curtis? Klamath Falls, Oregon, about 30 miles north of the California border. South Central it. Oregon. Downtown yeah. Klamath Falls. We may hear some some cars or sirens or crazy downtown people screaming as they go by. Who knows? We'll see what happens. I like Klamath Falls. <laughs> I've been there before. Oh, have you? Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. What brought you to Klamath Falls? Um, my ex-husband had family in uh, Portland, and so we'd go, you know, once a year and then drive up all up and down the coast. And then we I also lived in San Francisco, and we would drive up the coast. Oh, okay. So I, I it's just beautiful country. And it's, really we had is. a cousin in Bend, and so sometimes we'd go there and then tootle around everywhere. Great. Go down. Well, cool. Well, um, uh, uh, Curtis, class of 85. Again, yes, welcome. So, you know, uh, I've always known you and, and some of the other guys, you know, always played guitar. And, and uh, when did you pick that up? I first started playing drums in sixth grade in at Ash in the band. And then when I was 13, um, I had met Ted Culp in sixth grade and uh, he played guitar. And so I got a bass guitar for Christmas when I was uh, maybe, I guess I was 12 when I got that bass. And so I started playing bass and then we would jam out in his basement. And uh, then I played bass until I was 19 living in Lubbock, Texas. And Ted and Braxton Howe had this band and they were looking for a rhythm guitar player. So I went down to the music store and I bought a, a guitar and I just started watching um, what they were doing and I just started just playing just so I and then I joined the band so oh, you were wow. self-taught on bass as well uh yeah pretty much I didn't have any lessons in high school I tried to take some lessons later on when I went to South Plains College some steel guitar a little guitar some stuff like that uh but mainly just self-taught what about reading music did you learn how yeah, to a little bit you know I was reading drum stuff I was in band until uh sophomore year I was lead drummer. I was playing in the symphony and stuff. And then uh, my mom wouldn't let me go see the Judas Priest uh, screaming for vengeance to her Amarillo. So I quit band and I went to the concert in Lubbock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what year was the uh, concert? Uh, Do you remember? That around 82. All right. Because I saw them in 79, I believe, but they weren't in the opening band. I mean, they weren't the headliner. Uh, group called wireless opened up and then judas priest and then ufo oh so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah first yeah. time i saw him was in amarillo i didn't even know who they were that was june of 1980 it was the uh british steel tour def mm -hmm. leopard opened up it was their very first tour in a, the united states so there's like little kids you know like 16 years old and and i sat on the stage with trey beasley we we were getting crushed kind of stage in the auditorium in amarillo so this big old husky uh roadie guy came up and pulled us up onto the stage and set us there and we just sat there the entire time oh that's cool I were you what do you i mean would you guys like oh shit some burly guy grabbed me at first were you kind of like nervous no not you really we're glad to be on, yeah we're glad to be on stage <laughs> and that's i'm on the uh, point of entry tour and then the screaming for vengeance tour and uh yeah i was a big heavy metal fan back in the day so I, I want to know, did you have permission to go to those concerts? Did you sneak out to go to those concerts? 
Uh, most concerts I had permission to go to. The first one I ever went to was Ted Nugent and the Romantics in the Coliseum. And then uh, <clears throat> the one, there was one concert that uh, we snuck out to. It was Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast Tour. And I think, uh, I can't remember who was, uh, maybe Fastway was opening or was Fastway with Black Sabbath. I can't remember. Anyway, we were not supposed to go that Number of the Beast Tour. And Ted and I drove up there and bought a case of Michelob. And uh, I guess we were like 16 or something. And we were there in the Lubbock uh, Memorial Civic Center. And right before Iron Maiden was coming on, we hear this Ted. We turn around and there's his mother and dad standing right there. They bought a ticket to come in and get us and pull it, drag us out of there and take us back to Plainview. Oh, no way. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I missed how, the number of the beast tour. Oh, man. How did you guys get there? He had a, a Mustang. We just drove up in his car. Okay, and then how were you guys? Again, this is forty plus years ago. How uh, how'd you guys get the alcohol? Uh, we would go out to the second strip. You just wouldn't shave, and you just kind of put on some clothes and look <laughs> over. And they had that second strip out there in Lubbock, and we would we had this one little place that we would go to. I think it was called Ice House or something like that. And they would always sell Michelob to us. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> especially his uh, mom and dad coming in wow yeah so when ted's parents showed up were y'all a little inebriated did they know you'd been drinking oh yeah by the time they got to the car his dad rode back with us he looked in the bag and he goes oh my god because we had so much beer in there so i think his dad i think yeah i think the dad well joel wound up taking the beer i was gonna say did he pop one open <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh my gosh I don't wow. even know how they found us, but they did. Oh, gosh. So my first concert was Quiet Riot at the Coliseum in Lubbock. That was a good show. I did not enjoy it. I was not into that music. I I'm, Some friends made me go, and, you know, I waited for Come On, Hear the Noise or whatever that song was, and then I went out to the out to the lobby area, and I waited out there, which was a really good thing for me because, unbeknownst to me, they were smoking dope, and they got arrested. And had oh, I been man. with them, I wouldn't have smoked, but I, you know, could have been guilty by association. I just see all my friends being, you know, handcuffed out. I'm like, oh my gosh, thank God I wasn't in there. That would well, have been about 83 or 84. Yeah. Because, yeah, somewhere around in there. It was right after I graduated high school and we were in 83. So, yeah. Yeah. Summer, fall of 83, I think it was. Well, my, my one uh, was Boston 78. So, uh, and uh, Sammy Hagar opened up for him. Uh, I think he just left Montrose and then uh, went solo and then he opened up for Boston. That was a pretty damn uh, good concert. I bet it was. Yeah. So, you know, talking about heavy metal, Curtis, this is a good segue to ask you. So were you ever in a band? Because I don't know if you saw our, our show uh, last month and we had Rampage on. And we talked about another band called The System. And I, I didn't know if you joined a band in high school or. Well, I knew of The System and it's S-Y-S-T-A-M, not T-E-M. Oh. oh. And, uh, and I'd heard of Rampage. So Ted had joined The System in eighth grade and they came and played at like our spring prom banquet thing there in the Estacado um, cafetorium thing. You know, they had a little stage and you'd go eat in there. And Ted had joined that band. So I knew of the system. I knew Mark and David and Andy Barry and all those guys. And I still see Mark Lanston and I'm still in touch with him. And I just saw David, him and David McDonald about uh, back in September when we had a uh, Ted's little memorial service. And then, um, so I've stayed in touch with all those guys. So I wound up getting in a band with Greg Carroll. And oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So Greg was a guitar player and I was a, uh, I was playing bass at that time, and then we had Ricardo Ibarra on, on drums, and we had a little trio, and then this guy named uh, Donnie moved to town. I can't remember Donnie's last name, um, and his two sisters, and then so Donnie was a singer, and we put this band together called Rock Soft, R-O-X-O-V, and uh, we our first gig was Blackout on 24th Street. There's like a dirt road that goes down to Thunderbird. There's a bunch of fields out there and stuff, like little lakes and things, and there were some trailer houses there, and uh greg and i think brad cross and maybe ben cross were living there so we built a stage out back and had our first gig there and then our our biggest gig would have been out at nicole mcneese's house out in the country it was a big backyard party and uh 
Yeah, that was quite a quite a good night. And what uh, <laughs> were y'all were y'all playing covers or you know what kind of music were you playing? Uh yeah, I can remember we did uh we did some Iron Maiden. I think we did the Trooper, and we did that uh, autograph song. Um, oh yeah, um, and uh, turn up the radio. I think was mm -hmm. the name of it. Yes, and it was. Did some Def Leppard, some Aerosmith, you know, all all the stuff of the day. You know? How was vocals? Donnie was doing vocals. Okay. I can't remember Donnie's last name. To, I just can't remember. That was a very short-lived band. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun, you know. And then it wasn't soon after that, I guess, you know, getting close to graduation. And then I went off to Angelo State University and roomed with Debs Fulton for a semester down there until they kicked me out. And then I uh, came back to Plainview, went to Wayland for a semester, and then moved to Lubbock in 86 to go to Texas Tech. That didn't last very long. And um, but when I was back in Plainview. I was playing with Greg a little bit, just jamming down in the cellar in the basement and giving some bass lessons. And then I had a nasty motorcycle wreck. And it was soon after that that I moved to Lubbock. When did you start? Um, like, when did you get serious about your music, your music education? Uh, well, I always liked playing music. You know, I always listened to music, and right. so I was, I was always playing. But I guess when I was nineteen and I moved to Lubbock. <clears throat> Greg Harding and I got an apartment together over in uh, West Lubbock at this country park apartments. And, uh, and we were living over there. Braxton would come over all the time. Other people would come over. Ted was there. Scott Folger lived with us for a little while. Um, we only had two bedrooms, but we had this huge closet under the stairs. So we let Scott move into the closet under the stairs. And, uh, you know, that's just the way it was back then. And, uh, and that's when I started playing guitar. And then I got with in, in the band with Ted and Braxton and we were called Tribal Soul. And then we started playing like Main Street Saloon. Um, <clears throat> we were in a battle of the bands. That would have been New West back then. We're 34. Oh, Street. yeah. I remember Slide, that place. Slide. And we thought we were going to win, man. You know, we were like, we we're, we're a pretty good band. And uh, we got second place, but we came off stage. We were second to last. Everybody was loving us. And then waiting in the wings uh, was the band Boycott, which was a trio, um, all female band. And they said, man, you guys are really good, but we're getting ready to kick your ass. And they went on stage and won the whole thing. And then they got to open up for Night Ranger. That was the winning thing was to get to open up for Night Ranger in the Coliseum. Oh, my. oh so I was, yeah. you guys this close, I guess. Got that you close. They go to Night Ranger and see Night Ranger. Got to see Boycott open up for Night Ranger. So That's pretty cool. Did they make it? bigger than that i mean they're just oh, they the turned one. around and <clears throat> yeah they turned around they did houston made, you know nothing nothing too famous just more yeah. so. did y'all become friends with them oh yeah yeah i know for years and i'm still friends with the drummer vicky stewart she's living down That's like so in cool. Palm springs or something yeah oh, oh wow you know by the way we're gonna have uncle nasty on the show in about four weeks <laughs> Good, good, good. good. Well, Greg and I are still great friends, and you know, Greg and I had a band together, and uh, so I was living in Lubbock, and you know, we were in Tribal Soul, and uh, we played a New Year's Eve gig. It was 1989, going into '90, and we played. We got hired to play out at the Yellow Rose, which was a Bandito strip club. Oh, uh, I've been there, bro. I'm, oh, oh, I went uh, once and only and, once. Uh, and and so I had to go to Rio Dosa the next day, and I couldn't for the life of me remember where I left my guitar. And so I was worried about it the whole time. And uh, so I get back and I go out to our jam shack, was this storage thing. And as soon as I pull up, I see like guitar tubes and other things laying out there, and everything had been stolen out of our. Uh, out of a practice area so that was the end of the band and uh so ted and i then i had a real crappy acoustic and he had a crappy acoustic had a mic we had two microphone stands without bases so we put one in a bucket of sand and then we had two cinder blocks that would use and we would go host a jam out at the yellow rose called the gunny sack jam and uh, so we hung out there for for a while doing that and um and then uh 
I was working out for Scott Manufacturing. I did a lot of metal work. I was in the Vicar program, metal trades in high school. And so I did a lot of sheet metal, a lot of metal work coming out of high school. And I got, I quit one day because I got, I was supposed to be on this laser shear as the new greatest technology. And they were going to send me to Cincinnati to learn all this laser stuff. And then they wound up giving the job to somebody else. So I quit and I called Greg Harding up and I said, listen, man, I just quit my job. And so uh, let's start a band. And he goes, all right, well, hang on. And he called me back about 15 minutes later. And he goes, all right, I just talked to this guy named Fast Eddie Lopez and he's in. And so I said, all right, I'm driving up there. And so I was married at that time and my uh, son was two. And I was like, okay, I'm moving to Denver and going to be in a band. And it was just like, what? And so I just loaded up and went up there. And we booked a gig that same day for six weeks later on Halloween night. And we didn't even really have the band together. We didn't have any music. And so, but I drove up there and we found a drummer. He didn't work out too well. And then we found another guy named Thor, perfect drummer for us. And then it was about a week or so, maybe 10, two weeks before the gig, we finally found a bass player. And we, I wrote, Greg and I wrote about 12 or 13 songs within that six weeks. And then we performed them that night. And it was a blast, man. It was like, we were the craziest band in Denver, Colorado. It was, we were called Nasty <laughs> Nightmare. It was shock rock. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. It was like, we were crazy and we would get banned for doing things and we would bring donuts. We had a song called Donuts and we'd bring our first gig. We had all these powdered donuts. <laughs> they were everywhere because everybody was throwing donuts. And man, that bar owner was so mad. We had to go back and clean up all the donuts the next day. He was so mad at it. So by the time I left the band, we played New Year's Eve, opening up for Mr. Big in the Denver Auditorium. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah, we were banned from, we couldn't drink. I don't think we could drink on stage. I don't know, maybe. No, I guess we could, but we couldn't uh, We couldn't hang Greg. Normally, we would hang him from a noose. No donuts, no uh, dildos allowed on stage, and no naked women. So that... Uh, well, that's for a lot of fun. They should have gone back to the Yellow Rose. <laughs> they would have accepted all that shit. <laughs> so uh, no, that was a good, that was a crazy six months of my life. So wow. And so, I, I, what did your wife think about all this? She came and took me back to Lubbock. <laughs> <laughs> that's that funny. Fun. So. Yeah. And then, so I moved back and then uh, I started working at Orlando's. I had been working at Orlando's before as a cook. And then, so I just called up Orlando's, Hey, I need a job. And I drove into town, went straight to work. And I worked there for a long time. And then there I met uh, a guy named Trent and a guy named Mike, Mikey. And we started a band called Monkey Wrench Cafe. And we were like a progressive rock, promise, funk kind of out there kind of band and then we started playing around town you know we played kitchen club a lot uh main street annex and we were doing that and then um <clears throat> at the same time i was going to south plains i'd already started going to south plains college like in 1987 and then i went back in the 90s and um uh, that's when i had already met mark murray who was in this band called asparagus nightmares he was in this band uh called the Warren Commission, and they had this man, band called Mosquito Bites, and we were going to open up for them and do a one-two double punch album or cassette release party, and then they wound up uh, getting rid of their guitar player, and he, and then I wound up joining that band and was in that band until 97, and we were recording an album, and then the studio that we were recording in, it was another progressive rock band, it suddenly closed, and so the band broke up, and I was like, what am I going to do? And that's when I decided to go to Texas Tech and get a history degree. And uh, I already had my associates from South Plains College and Sound Technology. And I've been working at Don Caldwell Studios, helped open the Cactus Theater, um, all of that kind of stuff. And then wound up going to Texas Tech and started working at the Vietnam Archive and then just became this archivist and, and wound up starting a music archive after Don Caldwell Studios closed down. And that was about 2002, I started there, so I did a music archive for about 20 years, collecting music, had a radio show, taught history of West Texas music. Uh, yeah, those are great. And then May of 2023, I'd, I was done, and I left Lubbock and moved to Oregon. Why Why did you move? I mean, what did, did you just moved up there? Or did you have a job in, uh, lined up? 
Well, I stayed at tech as long as I could retire. And my wife took a job at Oregon Tech up here, and uh, which okay. was a senior track position. I was like, hey, I'm getting near retirement, so go ahead and take it. And then I started teaching online for Oregon Tech, and I still teach for Oregon Tech. I teach uh, in their humanities department. I teach U.S. history and uh, American media studies, and I teach history of Pacific Northwest rock and roll. And then I'm starting a new education program where we're going to be teaching uh, audiovisual continuing technical education in theater, doing audio, video, lights, stuff like that in the theater, partnering with a local uh, community college and the high schools. Have you written a book, by the way? I started writing a uh, history of West Texas music. I got about to 1950 when Buddy Holly met Elvis. And then I've just never, I was going to write it during the, uh, I took a sabbatical in March of, or in 2020. And then of course we all know what happened in 2020. And then that just got put off. And so I've never got back to it. I'm just, I've been so busy. And then I have planned just to retire and play music up here when in May and uh, 2023. And then I lasted about six months and I got, unretired and now i'm working at the ross Island theater's executive director because they needed some help yeah so how did oh, nice. you how did you get that gig i was uh president of the klamath folk alliance which is a local music organization and we'd been having our uh music festival there at the theater and stuff and i just one of the board members the president the chair of the board called me up and wanted to know if i wanted to be interim and i said no, I don't think so. I'll be a consultant, but then some things happen. Then I wound up being interim. And next thing I know, I'm committed over there. And I probably should be committed for working too hard, but uh, I work all the time. So I've got that job. I'm also right now working on an appraisal job for a big music collection over in Massachusetts that the guy's going to donate to university. So I do appraisal work on music collections still and then um, play music when I can and teach. So when you say music collection, what what type? Uh, this particular collection is several thousand recordings of jazz and blues. Okay. Wow. Like CDs, 78s, records, cassettes, VHS. It's it's a massive collection that this guy has amassed. He's like, he's a doctor and he's like around 90 years old or something, getting close there. And he's going to donate it all to uh, a university. Nice. Wow. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you, what? tell me what you got your uh, doctorate degree in. It was in a uh, history Okay. So, like I said, I have my associate's degree in technology. Then I went and got my history degree, and my bachelor's and master's were all in Vietnamese studies. And then when I moved to the Southwest Collection, I changed to American West, and that's when I did more of the music stuff and the history of Lubbock music, and really dug into collecting music of the of West Texas and you know Southwest and and a lot of Texas stuff. And that's when I started my radio show, Music Crossroads of Texas. And that ran for about seven years on the NPR station on 89.1 KTTZ and also wow. at San Angelo KNCH. So you got your doctorate at Tech as well? Yeah, master. I got my undergrad, master's and PhD all at Texas Tech, all in history. Oh, nice. Cool. Well, I want to go back to you were playing in the Lubbock area. Did uh, yeah. any of um, our classmates come see you guys play? or? Uh... uh... Oh, well, yeah. I mean, um, God. Did you, ha did you have a following? I don't know if we ever really had a following. You know, we just, we would go to the open jams. We'd book gigs. It was just the, you know, back then you could have a kind of built-in crowd on a Friday or Saturday night, depending on where you're playing. And, uh, you know, occasionally we would see people from school, um, mainly a lot of Lubbock friends um, that we would hang out with, you know, just meeting a lot of people there. I've, Still got a whole lot of Lubbock friends, a lot of musician friends from there that didn't go to school with. Um, I remember when Greg and I were living in Country Park that first uh, fall of 86, there were these girls living next door and they're having a party and we we're having a party and they were beating on the wall, I guess, because we were too loud. And we wound up punching a hole through the wall into their apartment. And then we became friends with them. And so uh, start all started hanging out. And I met my, one of the girls I met worked at Buffalo Beano's. And I got a job over there working at Beano's. <laughs> the head head store. That yeah. Job. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, <laughs> it was a lot of fun playing music. Uh, time, what was the highest paid gig that you had during that era? It's eighty six, eighty seven. You remember? Uh, well, back then you might make. 
you know, a hundred, two hundred dollars for a group, the same that you make right these days, 40 years later, 35 years later, it's the same <laughs> amount of money. You know, if you're making a hundred, 200 bucks for a band, you're doing great. You know, probably somewhere about a hundred bucks or whatever. And you'd be lucky to get a bar tab. Um, I remember the, the banditos didn't pay us, but we had a really good time. Yeah, so. I wasn't across them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we I played softball and and actually the uh, they sponsored our team <laughs> once. Yeah, yeah, the one of the one of the guys frequently go, went there, and uh, uh, he got it. I forgot the guy's name. It was a big, fat old man. But uh, I, I hate to say, I know where that place is. <laughs> I remember running sound out there one night, and they got raided by the sheriff's department. And all these deputies and sheriffs showed up. It was packed out, and we were running sound for this band, and. Uh, I had a fog machine so i just hit the button and filled the place with smoke and by the when the smoke cleared everybody had run away you know it was just like chaos people were running at their tables with chairs knocking all around and stuff it was hilarious but <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of fun doing what we did you know gosh yeah anytime we could play music or just jamming and then you know i kind of stopped playing for a while in the early 2000s and then i decided to kind of get back into it after a few years around 05 i started writing music again and then i put out a i had some songs so i went out to route one a cuff studios and recorded a cd it took several years to do it but uh and that was the first thing that i had released by myself that i called people's collective and then i had released one cassette with monkey wrench cafe called cluster funk and then um I don't even have a copy. The only person I know that has a copy, I think, well, I mean, I have some digital copies of stuff, but the actual cassette, the only person I know that has one is Trey Beasley. He has, he has like everything that I've ever put out and, and any other <laughs> local people do the good man just collects everything. It's great. He's your That's super fan. Cool. <laughs> That's cool. So, um, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mike. No, no, no. I was just going to get back to some of the high school. Uh, yeah. What's some of, uh, some of the cool memories you had uh, going to, play view high well back then we like to party a lot you know and uh, i guess enough time has passed but uh i can remember my mom worked in the cafeteria you know she was like in charge there and uh so anytime there was a pep rally or something we'd run down and hide in the storeroom and then we would like go skip the pep rallies and stuff we'd go hide out in the kitchen and then um we just it, man, we were just like partying and playing music all the time. That's it was all about rock and roll, you know, back then. Oh, yeah. it was just it was it was on. That was like the hair metal days, you know. That stuff was big in LA and the Motley Crew and all of that stuff. And you know, Rat man, I just loved Rat. And we just it was all about weekends and going to the bootlegger and getting some beer and some smoke and all of that kind of stuff. And we just had a really good yeah. time. It, it just we were happy. You know, we had no responsibilities. Everybody was working, though. As far as I can remember, we all had jobs or generally taking care of ourselves, you know, with our own money and stuff. But uh, it was just, it seems like every weekend there was a party. That's just what yeah. you did in Plainview, you know? Yeah, exactly. Did you have, uh, do the Fifth Street Drag or Fun Station? I think that was pretty popular when, like, Lisa and I were seniors and you guys were. Sophomores. Oh, man, we, um from the time I was probably 13, 14, we were going to the space station all the time. You know, you you just would drag Fifth Street. You'd have to Gibson's parking lot and you go down, turn around, spud nut and all that. Back down to the space station, hang out or hang out in the Gibson's parking lot. All of that. Yeah, we did all of that for, for years, you know. And yeah. I don't know how many quarters I put in video games or playing pool there in the back of the space station. And those are really fun times. And then just hanging out at people's houses. And then school, you know, I, I I passed. I don't really ever remember what my grades were or anything, but somehow I got out of high school and graduated. <laughs> was you, any, go ahead, Lisa. Your, your target. Go ahead. So I was curious why you quit band. Did you love music so much? Why did you quit band after your sophomore year? To go see Judas Priest screaming for vengeance. Remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, to go um, to that concert. Wanna... That was the reason. Everybody was so mad at me, too. I think that's one of the, you know, they say don't ever have any regrets. That was one of my regrets 
But then at the same time, I don't regret seeing Judas Priest on that iconic tour. So it's this and that, you know. And so all of the crazy things and stupid things you do make you who you are in the end, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I wish I could have gone back and stayed in band. Yeah, I mean, so you didn't feel like once you quit, there was an opportunity to go back? Uh, O.T. Ryan was so mad at me. I don't even know if he would have let me back in. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. Were your parents mad at you? What's that? Were your parents mad at you? Yeah, but all of that, you know, it blew over and just went on doing my thing. And, yeah. you know, I wound up getting a metal trades, you know, into the, right. into the, that program and did that all my junior and senior year. And so that was great, you know, welding and lathe work. And I was working in, Hell County sheet metal before I was even out of high school and then working at Lubbock sheet metal and off to the other Scott manufacturing and stuff. So I got pretty good at layout and doing all those kinds of things. So, you know, I'm really big on vocational skills and learning all of that. I think that that's the right Avenue for some people. Of course, then I wound up getting all into the academic stuff too. So I think it all kind of balances out. Well, it sounds like you need, you had a few years that you needed to sow your oats. <laughs> yeah. Some days I feel like I still need to, but I'm getting too old. It's getting hard to get oh, up and down the stairs. No, no. <laughs> so is, there a, is there a teacher that um, really helped you out or that you had a good relationship with or just left a, a, a really good imprint on you? From I that? always like Mr. White in Metal Trades was very a very good teacher for me. Um, Mrs. Dixon, you know, she taught what, home ec and all of that stuff. And I can remember me and Greg going over, she hired us to go clean her pool. And it was like a, we had to go like scrub it down with sulfuric acid and all this stuff. So she was, I thought she was always a really cool teacher. Um, who else did we have in high school? The, um, I can't remember the chamber choir's name. Oh, we were, I was playing bass and Greg Carroll was playing guitar. What was his name? He wasn't there a long time. I'd have to go look at an annual, but that was a that was fun playing in the chamber choir. Just playing, you know, we were the the instruments. We weren't doing any singing, and uh, so that was a good class to be in. But most of the time, it's just like as soon as we got a break, man, we were out of school and we had this secret spot that we would go to. You know where all of those trailer parks? I think behind the Walmart distribution center are. There's like a trailer park over there. Well, it was undeveloped for many years and they just had everything laid out. It was just like the land and then they had the site and they built all these walls and concrete and you could like drop down into these like tunnel things underneath there and stuff. And then had this wall back over there and we cleaned out all the weeds and we could park our cars back there and we would just hang out there and never be found by anybody. We called it the wall. And uh, <laughs> of course, Pink Floyd was out at that time. And so I remember hanging out over there. Like It was just like, it's kind of like that if you watch those 80 movies of kids growing up in suburbia kind of thing, you know, you're getting the cable TV. There's a, a great, a great Matt Damon uh, movie. What is the name of it? Over the edge, over the edge. And it yeah. was kind of those days, you know, and uh, it was like the Van Halen and all that stuff. Yeah. It was, life was a lot like that movie. It was, that was based on the true story or true event. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we're all the generation of the very, you know, the inception of MTV. So that was a really big thing, um, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, that movie Over the Edge and The Outsiders. They said Matt Damon. It wasn't Matt Damon. It was Matt no. Damon. Uh, uh, I know you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Got the eyebrows. But, and, and well, the that outsiders. movie and The Outsiders, he was killed, yeah. both of those movies, by, by holding a, a an, an empty gun. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah but movies but i remember cable tv being a big thing and then when mtv came out man it was like matt we were dylan. it was a yeah. big thing. it was matt dylan matt dylan yes yeah but yes uh what were you saying about mtv i remember it was like you would you would just sit there for hours waiting exactly for, yeah. your, for your video to come on. You know, there was no YouTube or anything, and mm -mm. it was like I remember they were going to have a like Judas Priest in concert. Man, we, we just like we're so ready for that, you know. And that's we just planned our whole week around it and your whole day, and you'd be just like sitting there waiting for like 
rat wanted man to come on or whatever you know the the bands of the day and it was just it was it was a really good time when mtv was cool when mtv was cool yeah i remember Absolutely. Friday night staying up you know till the wee hours until it went off the air yeah it was a lot of fun so when yeah, did we you still love music what's that when did you start singing uh well i don't know if i really do sing but i i just do it i started in well, you do about sing. 90 Three, yeah, I started about ninety three, just out of necessity, in the in the Monkey Wrench Cafe band, just started writing songs, and I still go out and play. My just had a gig this past Saturday, um, a little roots music thing. Where I was doing some folk and blues, and I partnered with a friend of mine named Dana Worth, and she does like Western music, and she's a trained opera singer. She's got this phenomenal voice, and so um, we just kind of did this song swap in this historic hotel museum called the Baldwin here, Baldwin Hotel and Museum in Klamath. And uh, so I'm still trying to get out and play because that's still what I really want to do. And uh, I'm working on a, I was working on a folk music CD before I left Lubbock and I'm trying to get that thing finished up. It's just, I'm so busy working all the time. Let me ask but, you this. Yeah. Is there a reason you didn't go to Austin and move there? I almost did when I was 17. Right before graduation, I I remember I had this Yamaha motorcycle and my friend Nicole was moving with her family to Austin. And I was like literally sitting there contemplating riding my motorcycle up the ramp into this ride <laughs> truck and moving to Austin with them. And my parents were like, oh, you can't do that, man. I mean, I was old enough, could have done it, yeah. but, uh, but I didn't do it. I went ahead and stayed in Plainview. So, but I, I was... I was really close to doing that. And I wound up going to San Angelo instead to to go to Angelo State. Well, our classmate, Alex Gonzalez, you know, he he lived in Austin for many years and he got heavily involved with South by Southwest. And man, he uh he he enjoyed uh you know volunteering and working during the uh the event. So just figured that that would be you as well. But you know, everybody goes their own di a different direction. Oh yeah. So, and then, like I said, I wound up in Denver and I tried to go to California one time in the late eighties and I, I was going to hitchhike out there and I made it as far as Loveland. I only had on a denim jacket. I was wearing <laughs> boots. I had a guitar with me and I made it to the other side of Loveland. And I remember it was hot and I was like, man, this is too far to walk to Los Angeles. So I just, uh, I hitchhiked back to Lubbock and, uh, that was an experience in itself. And, uh, yeah, so I never made it out to California. So any of the songs you guys wrote, were there any ex high school experiences, ex-girlfriends? Um, not really. Most of my experiences would have been from living in Lubbock. Okay. Yeah. Nothing from high school, really. Like We were just doing cover tunes in, in high school, so... Um, and then when we had Tribal Soul, um, no, nothing really. They were all just sort of these really just, they were songs, you know, they may be about like a ship or something on the ocean. And and then we just experiences that we were experiencing then, you know, uh, nothing really from the past that I can remember. Ted wrote a few things about maybe a couple of high school things, but um uh, or that it might have been intertwined into the uh, the songs or something. But other than that, no, it's nothing that I can really recall. And most everything these days, like all my blues and folk music, um, I'm writing like Dust Bowl music, like old timey kind of sounding stuff. I've got a couple of those songs. And then I write some funky little kind of grooves and things. So I do like blues and folk and still some kind of rock pop kind of stuff. What is what inspires, what inspires your music writing? Um, like my one song that I like to play all the time that everybody likes is called Do Believe. And when I was working in the music archive, we were doing this interview with Tommy Hancock and he owned the Cotton Club out there in Lubbock, you know, and that's where Buddy Holly bet Elvis and he had a house band out there, Tommy Hancock and Roadside Playboys. So it's all these years later, I was working with the family and his daughter was... I set up all the equipment and she was doing these interviews and I went outside of the Godbode Cultural Center to 
and I came back and the door was locked and I couldn't get in. So I had this little chair in the back of the Ford Explorer. So I popped it out and there was kind of a windy day and this half of a cigarette carton blew up. So I just started writing a song about not being able to get back in there. Um, <laughs> the latest song that I wrote, um, I was playing at the Baldwin hotel about six weeks ago and I've got this resonator guitar. It's all metal. And there's these stained glass um, windows up above and the shining, the light was shining through and reflecting off of that uh, guitar. And so I, was, Ooh, I posted this picture. It said stained glass reflections. And this friend of mine named Mike Allen Ward lives over in Montana. He writes for, uh, he writes songs. He goes, Oh, you got to put that in a song. And so I wound up putting it in a song. It's something I'm working on right now. So it's just, you just never know. It just inspiration can come out of left field or, if I tried, I've got some songs I've been working on for 15 years that I still haven't finished. Wow. Yeah. You need to get back to that book, man. Yeah, that too. And that's just yeah. the history of West Texas music, but I'd like to finish that up. Yeah. No, that, I think you should. That is definitely a project that we encourage you, you know, somewhere in the, if you can find some spare time, you know, maybe in your second act of retirement. That's what I was about to say. So I'm going to have to retire again in order to do that. <laughs> <laughs> So have you gone back to any of your high school reunions? Are you, are you planning to go to your 40th next year? I would like to go to the 40th. I went to the 10 and the 20. And then um, we were talking about doing like a 30. And I don't know if that ever, or did we go, did we have a 30? I can't remember. Maybe it was the 25th was the last one I went to. And then we were talking about doing five, one five years later or something. And, and I don't think it ever happened. And uh, yeah, I'd like to go back to the 40th. And, you know, it's, what's interesting about Plainview and, and some, a lot of people I know that they don't understand the, these class relationships and how you stay friends. I mean, I've known Nita and Rita Sanders and Christy Watson since third grade, no first grade, first grade, you know, I've known Trey Beasley since third grade and we've stayed friends, you know, all these years, you know, and uh, you know, mainly me and Trey, but you know, it's, it's amazing how you know all of these people and you just kind of remain friends and you can just, you can not see somebody for 15 years, but just pick right up. Like it's yesterday. Hey, you remember when we did such and such, you know, it's just Plainview's got a really unique dynamic like that. And then I was talking to Greg the other day about this whole gold knuckle thing, which was this unique moment in time and place <laughs> that this happened, you know, I can remember playing bloody knuckles on the bus with the combs and stuff. And then, the, Oh yeah. Then, then yeah. goat knuckle comes along and everybody's goat knuckling. Where the hell did it come from? You know, I, I, so, um, someone told me that back in the seventies, people will pop you in the back of the head with the goat knuckle. And then somehow it involved to this. But they would hit maybe the 60s. I don't know, but they would pop you know, each other in the heads with the two knuckles. Like with the class rings or just the two I, I don't know if it, she mentioned class rings, but she said with the fingers. But I, I know the class rings, they would turn that, you know, yeah. inside and pop. <laughs> but that's uh, <clears throat> that's what I heard. That's the, to me, that's the best uh, origin. So who knows? Yeah, but as far as who started saying goat knuckle, we don't know. I mean, there's speculation and theory of two different people, but, you know, until somebody comes forth and said, hey, I did that, we don't know. Well, Probably has to, some, something to do with the goat man lore of Plainview and, and all of that. And it just, and it just happened. You know, one person said it and it just caught on like a wow. Well, it's okay. I, I've got, I've got a trademark. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, I was, I don't know. I was born and raised there, and I don't know anything about the Goat Man. Oh, really? No, uh, well, it was it was just a reason to take girls out to the silos, right? And uh, and scare the shit out of them. <laughs> well, my parents didn't let me do any of that stuff, so of course I wasn't going to hear about it. <laughs> but uh, what kind lot. of what kind of vehicle did you drive back in high school? Uh, so I remember my parents letting us drive this crappy Mercury Brown Maverick. I hated that car. It was brown. <laughs> we called it the turd, you know, because it was just like that. 
And then my dad had this big four wheel drive Chevy uh, long bed pickup that I liked that. Oh, but that thing would just suck down the gas. And then I remember my first car was a Chevy Nova and it was mm. 500 bucks or something, ugly green color and uh pea green or something. It was horrible Nova color. And I had it and Greg Carroll and I were in chamber choir and God, what was the director's name? I can't not remember. Anyway, he thought we were real funny when we were high. So he let us, we went out to go get some hamburgers and uh, we wound up, there was nothing going on in choir that day. So we left and we were driving down that dirt road behind Thunderbird to go park out there. We had these hamburgers and there was this uh, like, I don't know, some sort of water cover thing in the ground and my transmission hit it and it pulled that thing out of the ground and rolled underneath my car. So I only had that car a week and totaled it. Oh my God. <laughs> was it a Mr. Lang? Yeah. That, that really kind of rings a bell. Yeah. That was him. I'm, I'm looking in the annual. So I should have brought my annual out, but it's downstairs in the basement somewhere. Yeah, I've got them right here. Yeah, that was. So you told your vehicle, huh? Oh, the very first night I had it, I ran over a stop sign and then uh, shouldn't have been driving. But, and then. That one that totaled it was we were just skipping school and eat some hamburgers. Where did you guys eat? What did you frankly go eat? And by the way, it's, it was Ron, Ron Lang, by the way. Yeah, that particular day, I think we went by like, what was it? The little burger barn place there on like. Oh, yeah. Uh, Columbia. Columbia. There Columbia. The yeah, that little brown. Uh, I love their burgers. It was like three for a dollar or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah it was great. I walked there for yeah. my house. I, yeah, I loved it. Traditionally, you know, I can't get a burger for 17 bucks. Hell, that's, that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and you still get paid $100, $200 for gigs. <laughs> yeah, if I'm lucky. That reminds me, i got to send this guy an invoice. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, hey, I, I made 60 bucks in tips the other day, you know, so, and I, I guess it was tips. I gave out CDs. Whoever gave me money, I would give them CDs. So if they put money in the tip jar, then I gave them a couple of CDs. So I've got two CDs out. I got the People's Collective, and then I've got one called Nevadita, which is a concept album. And then I got this new one I'm working on that I'm calling tentatively um, Turn Row Troubadour, just about setting out in the fields out in East Lubbock County. And then um, writing some new music, you know, I just, I got tons of recording equipment. I got, I got about 25 guitars, you know, got basses, keyboards, got all of that stuff. And I just have no time to, to play these days. Do other musicians ever call you to um, come play um, on their records or uh, gig with them? Yeah, back in the 90s, I played and helped produce this girl named Shara Narayan in Lubbock. She went to Lubbock High School. And um, I played on played a little guitar part, a little lead guitar part on Carrie Swinney's album, uh, ne Neanderthal Man. I, I think that was on his Martha album. Um, I played on an album by a guy named Hayden Hughes. I remember we, were, we had uh, that... My Mosquito Bites band, um, our keyboard player was a big time engineer and he worked for this group called Richard's Group at one time. And he did like all the Home Depot commercials. He was the engineer for all that. So anything you heard was him. And he they did Porsche, Motel 6, all the stuff. But I remember working with him and he got this gig for us with the pork industry. And we're going to write all these songs about <laughs> pork in 1980s style. So we started writing all these songs, you know, about pork. We had this song called Tenderloin. It was this really lovey ballad kind of thing <laughs> and, and all this stuff. And we were like getting paid like $5,000 here and we're getting all this money. And then all of a sudden swine flu hit. And so it just pulled the rug right out from under us because they had to divert all of their, their money to combating the negative publicity of swine flu because people thought they were getting sick from eating pork, which was not the case, but uh, <laughs> just all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, I can't remember. Let's see who else have I played with? Um, sometimes it's just gigs, you know. I played, and then I did play some on a Jenny Del Lord's new album out of Lubbock. 
you ought to check out Jenny Dale Lord. Her new album, um, A Million Moments, is really great. It just released about a, just a few weeks ago. And so I brought her up to play at their music festival back in August. And um, yeah, so sometimes I get to play with other people and sometimes it's gigs and but not a lot of recordings recently. I'm trying to get back into that, though. Well, good. Have you ever uh, played with any European musicians? European? Mm -hmm. no, or I know of. No, I don't I don't think so. Most of it's just been local West Texas people or people here in Oregon. Yeah, that's about it, that, as far as I know. What's the population where you live? Uh, about 40,000. The county's okay. about 70. So it's a lot smaller. So Yeah. There's a town called Altamont, and there's Klamath Falls. Really, it's all Klamath Falls, but it's kind of too. It's like 2020. So, uh, But I'm living in the Klamath Falls side in downtown, just off of uh, Main Street over here. I literally live like 500 feet behind the theater that I work in. So that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, going back to the uh, re high school, you said you guys used to sneak out and go to the cafeterias. Did you guys ever get caught skipping? Because I understood if you got caught, you get your ass whooped by Mr. McBee. Oh, I got whooped by him for all kinds of things. But generally, I could get out because I had Alfred Henderson's uh, signature down. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> yeah. So I could write I could write notes and sign his name, and I would always get up. So I was usually had an excused absence. Nice. I'm forging his signature. <laughs> well, I had his wife for second grade, too. So I had Mrs. Henderson for, like, second grade. And I uh, was living in Amarillo for kindergarten, first grade, came second half of First grade, moved to Oakland Street. That's when I met Christy Watson, was the first person I met in Plainview. And then uh, we were going over to Highland at that time, and then Mrs. Henderson, second grade. And then, um, yeah, then that's just, we all moved together as as you did in Plainview. You know, you got out of those elementary systems, and then you got put into Lakeside and uh, Estacado into high schools, and you just kind of went together as that group. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Um yeah. Do you still have family in Plainview? I have two aunts that live in Plainview. I've got some cousins that live in Plainview. Uh, my parents are living down in Granbury, Texas. And my brother's in Granbury. I've got kids in Denver, Grapevine, Denton, um, and here. So. Do you have four kids? Uh, yeah, really five though. So I have a lot of a lot of kids, and most are grown. But my youngest right now is sixteen, and she'll be graduating in a couple of years. And then, uh, then I'll you know I'm because I'm at least going to work for a couple more years, I think, and then I'll think about retirement again. But I'm sh I sure am ready to start playing guitar before I can't, or back onto it before I can't play anymore. Because as you get older, you know things stiffen up a little bit here and there. But I try to play as much as I can. And uh, I just, I really, I really want to do music. That's what I want to do for the rest. Yeah. Are you going to stay there for the rest of your life? Is that where you're going to? I wouldn't mind going back to Colorado. Okay. I like Colorado a lot. And I like the Denver area or even, you know, maybe up north a little bit or something like that. Um, I, I really do like Colorado. I wouldn't mind playing like during the week, some folk music here and there and some clubs and all that. And then, getting together with my heavy metal friends and jamming out on the weekends, you know? <laughs> so I still, every now and then we'll have a, it's been a, probably about five years ago. We did a, a Nasty's nightmare reunion. We've done a couple of those and we're way better now than we were back then. Cause back then we were, uh, yeah, we, we were not in good shape. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but now I think everybody that was playing was sober now. So we actually had a, played pretty well i was like oh you guys are pretty good it's like well way better than we were back then so uh, we could barely even stand on stage so i mentioned uncle nasty uh greg yeah. uh what uh, two questions what uh what uh instrument did he play and uh what's uh what's a good question or a good story to ask him because actually i mentioned he'll be on the show in about four weeks 
So he was the singer of the band. I said, Greg, I, when I called him up, I was like, listen, man, you got this, you're the DJ and all this. Why don't you be the singer of the band and, and I'll be the guitar player. We'll get this other guitar player. And he went for it. So he was the singer. And uh, we may have some jets flying over. There's a, a Air Force base near here. And uh, so he was the singer. So our very first gig that we had the band showed up in a hearse to an event to bury him alive. And he got buried alive for 48 hours. And uh, so you can talk to him. He always, always, I think he was frozen alive one time. He's always doing stunts. I think he, yeah. I think in Amarillo, I can remember him like bungee jumping out of a hot air balloon. He's always doing crazy <laughs> stuff, man. Oh my God, that's crazy. Okay. So we have to ask him about being buried alive. <laughs> I know. And so, that that was that was a really interesting time. Um, so yeah, uh, just his radio career has really been really good. You know, he was doing that all the way back in high school at KBOP. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we should have uh, you and Trey Bisley uh, pop in. You know, maybe the last hour or the last thirty minutes of his show, and you guys can reminisce about the Lubbock times. Yeah, I mean, if Trey's available, I know he's really busy. He's a he's working over at Cap Rock Cafe. And in the kitchen over there, managing and doing stuff over there. So he stays busy quite quite often, especially during football season, you know. And uh, but yeah, I've known Trey. I, I knew Trey and Doug Brown since like third grade. And um, my dogs are barking. Somebody must be outside. And uh, yeah, just for a long time. And I still stay in touch with Trey all the time. And uh, I'm actually getting ready to. Send him some guitar picks. I just signed an artist deal with Breedlove Guitars. And so I just went and picked up a guitar. Uh, when was that? Last Tuesday. So a week ago. I've had this guitar for seven days. It was built on October 10th, I believe. So it's a it's a baby. It's like, it's a brand new guitar. And so I'm starting to play that. And, and Breedlove's out of Bend, Oregon. They got a manufacturing or their factories up there. So I went and uh, got an artist deal with them so I can play breed love guitars, but I'll play, also play all my other guitars too. But I just love my new one and i uh, going to start doing have that. It there to, do you have it there to show? I do. I thought you and then what's, it. and what's the oldest guitar do you have? Oh, wow. Well, that's, that's nice. That's nice, nice. Breed love. Nice. There. I don't know if you can see the breed love logo. Yeah. So this one's made in Oregon. And it's made out of uh, myrtle wood that this guy goes out and finds myrtle wood throughout Oregon, sometimes on the coast that washes up and everything. And I wish my dogs would stop barking. And uh, so, yeah. Let's hear how it sounds. I really like the sound. But it smells so new. Yeah. I, I, was, I was asking, what's the oldest guitar do you have? Your collection. Uh, I don't really have anything vintage. I don't think. Um, my first Martin I bought in like two thousand and five, and then I've got a couple of guitars from nineteen eighty: a Yamaha and a Sigma, and. Uh, I got two really nice guitars that I like that are custom guitars by Newman. One's purple and one's black with inlaid dice and it's got big dice knobs on it. Those are electrics. And then I got a Jimi Hendrix Stratocaster, not by Hendrix, but, you know, signature guitar. Also I got, um, I have a lot of guitars, so, uh. <laughs> but you can't have too many. I don't know. I just yeah. I could run out of space. Literally, when I was moving from Lubbock to here, I couldn't get any more guitars in my guitar in the car. I had this one beautiful bass, and I knew this bass player. They really wanted it, and he couldn't afford it. And so I wound up trading him. I said, I'll give you the bass if you play on my album. And so I just did a trade with him because I couldn't get another guitar in the car. And so I just wow. him, said, I'll trade you out. And um, he, he went for that. He took it home. His wife's like, what's that, you know? Why, why are you bringing home another guitar? She goes, no, 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 I didn't pay anything for it. It's just a trade. So, uh... That's a little generous of you. So, do any of your kids have the music bug? Um, I had a couple that took, like, orchestra in eighth grade, maybe seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade, some Suzuki violin lessons. My 
youngest daughter's at voice lessons right now. I'm taking voice lessons from my friend Dana, who's the opera singer. She also teaches here in town. So, um, yeah, so she likes to sing. And but she doesn't really do it professionally. And I just like to go play just because I like to write songs. I don't care if people like it. I don't care if they do like it. I just go out and play just because I like to do it. You know, it makes me feel good. It's very therapeutic. And I like writing songs and some are good and maybe some are not. I don't know. You should donate a, a jingle. Goat Knuckle Talk with Flow jingle. <laughs> I, can think, I can think about doing a Goat Knuckle song. Yeah, I'll think about Goat Knuckle. I'll have to think about that a little bit. Maybe it'd be a little, it could be like a little bit of a funky kind of song, I think. Goat Knuckle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah, I have to think on that a little bit because I do a lot of little... Uh... I do all kinds of little funky stuff. Yeah. That would be fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we've been on for about an hour. Uh we uh we really enjoyed you having on our show and uh and uh, learn a lot about you, man. I mean, didn't realize, uh, one, you were a doctor. And number two, you know, how much you've been in the music business and what all of you accomplished. Yeah, I'm booking shows right now over at the theater. And uh, that's a whole different animal. And really, things have changed since COVID. Things have gotten way expensive. It's hard to get people to to buy tickets and to come out because, you know, everybody's got apps on their TV. And they're going to watch Netflix and Max and Disney Plus and all of the the host of stuff that they got. And, uh, and then of course, ticket prices, man, we went down to took my daughters down to see Melanie Martinez and I set them kind of near the stage. That's 400 bucks a piece for a ticket. Jeez. Wow. I don't know. Yeah. So it's just nuts. Well, you guys could place uh, when you go to your reunion next year, you guys should do a little jamming and video it. I don't know. Who else in my class that plays? You should find out. I mean, we did a hair, we did a fake hair band, so and we're not musicians. Yeah, we surprised our classmates. Uh, we went and changed, and we did uh, photograph by you know Def Leppard, and uh, of course I had a black wig, but I had the Union Jack sleeveless shirt from the video. I had Andrew Dunlap, Quinnith, and Sean. Where they they had we all we had the '80s hair. Lisa was drumming with one hand behind her back, <laughs> even though during that photograph he had both arms, but just to be fun. So yeah, we had a good time, and we surprised. I had, I had my arm in the sleeve and 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 underneath my shirt, <laughs> <laughs> playing drums. Oh my god! Yeah. We're, what we call the deaf haggard, I guess. Deaf haggard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know anybody else in my class that, you know, like Greg was a year older. So, um, trying to think, I don't know if anybody else. Uh, I know one other guy from Plainview that's a little bit younger that he plays professionally. He's really good. Um, he's in love. His name's Jerry Serrano. Um, that's my that's my cousin. Jerry is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jerry's great. Jerry's great. Yeah, his, his dad is my his dad is my mom's brother. Or half I had brother. him play uh, trumpet on one of my. I wrote this little jazz song, and I had him play like this muted trumpet part. It's just this very jazz noir kind of thing, instrumental, called "My September Rain," which I want to write lyrics to. I just I only have "My September Rain," and that's as far as I've really got because I don't want to be corny with it, you know. But oh, be corny. <laughs> <laughs> Then Guns N' Roses do November rain. Yeah, they have November rain. There you go. Uh, like yeah, I was sitting there one day and I just. Uh... <laughs> just did this little jazzy progression thing. And I was like, yeah. my September rain. And then I was just like. Uh... And then I just wrote the instrumental song and then I had Jerry play on it. So, uh... yeah, there's that Plainview connection. You can go. If you go to, I think they're still up at Music Crossroads of Texas. I've got one called My Hometown. And so if you go to KTTZ, Music Crossroads of Texas, type in My Hometown, you'll get to hear music from Plainview folks. 
like Billy Beasley, Trey's dad, who had some great couple of great songs. Um, there was the string alongs. There were, I think I've got some Jerry on there. Other people like, um, do you remember Jana Bray? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's just... So her grandfather was a recording artist back in the 60s and early 70s and had a studio in Plainview. Really, really far out there stuff. I just love it. And um, you remember Dr. Sigler, they had a they had a band, him and some other doctors there in Plainview. Yeah, but he had this wonderful telecaster. I knew his daughter, daughter, Lori Sigler, and then he was my doctor, too. And then they would have those jazz jams and they lived right across the street from Ted. And so I remember getting to see his telecaster. I was like, oh, I bet. I don't know who has that thing, but I think it's probably worth a fortune. No, we crazy. bought. We had their sisters, uh, the the daughters. You just mentioned one of them. We Lord. had them on our show, like, geez, months, months ago, talking about uh, Mr. Sigler. Yeah, so, I loved him. He was a cool guy. So yeah. anyway, yeah. Well, hey, I do have another one more question. When sure. you first learned a song, what was it? Uh, hopefully, it wasn't "Smoke on the Water," but what do you recall? What was your first song mm -hmm. you remember? Uh, started playing or learned yeah it had been schools out uh, alice cooper on the bass and schools out for summer and then i remember that so that would have been eighth grade no we were in seventh grade when i started playing i can't remember if that at the end of that year no it was the end of our estacado year we went to mr key and and he we convinced him to let us play schools out over the PA system, and uh, and they let us do it. Oh, cool! The last day of school and played Dallas Cooper. So that was like the first song that I ever learned. And then, of course, there was "Smoke on the Water." And then I can remember sitting on the phone, and you know, back we had no cell phones back then. You had the the wall phone with the like twenty foot long cord. Oh yeah, you know, and. No, I remember learning Dazed and Confused by Led Zeppelin with Ted on the other line. He was like playing guitar and I'm trying to play bass and just over the telephone, like late at night, you know. <laughs> and uh, nowadays you can send really nice recorded tracks back and forth through the internet and do recording and all of that stuff. And uh, yeah, it's really cool. So, what song did you love playing the most? Um, Gosh, back then, I'm trying to remember. The song that I love playing the most was a song that was written by a guy named Harold Rogers. And he was a guitar player there in Lubbock. And Ted and I used to love it. He was older than us. And we'd go to Harold's house and he had this song, this groove. And I've incorporated Harold Rogers' licks and some of his songs into music that I do today, all these years later. So, oh, nice. And uh, so he called it World War III, and it's just a simple little group, but I will still play that all the time to this day. It's like one of the first things if I plug in a guitar, like I, if, I, if I get my Les Paul. And I like plug it in the Marshall or something like that. I'll like play that song or some variation of it. So that's just the one that's really stuck with me for probably 42 years. And that was just something written by a local guy in Plainview named Harold Rogers. Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah. Really, really, imprint, really imprinted on you. Oh, yeah. He had a recording Good. studio. We would jam. We'd play April Wine songs. And Oh, I love April play. Wine. I harder, fa harder, faster. That album is killer. It is. It is. They uh, they opened up for uh, Molly Hatchet in Lubbock, and I, in my opinion, they blew them off the stage. That was a great show. That yeah. was a really good show. Uh, and there was a lot band of gunshot. Somebody, there was a gunshot. No, I was gonna say it was about the Bandito. I think uh, no, a Bandito stabbed someone. Yeah, something happened. <laughs> I remember something went down at the Molly Hatchet show. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know about it until my dad read in the paper the next day. He goes, "Hey," I'm like, "What?" Yeah, some someone got stabbed. I'm like, "Oh, really?" I didn't. 
God, come, going remember. to concerts back then was just so cool. Yeah. So cool I remember thing. everybody talking about that concert in school afterwards. I still have some concert shirts. I still have my Ted Nugent shirt, my very first one. Oh, that shit. Camouflage. And it says Ted Nugent in blood. The sleeves are cut off, and I cut it off as like a half shirt. And I dare, I would dare not wear that half shirt these days. But <laughs> my, I think my daughter had it for a while, and she wore it, you know, or something like that. And I still got my Black Sabbath Heaven and Hell shirt from going to see that concert. The thing is worn so thin. I wore it in my uh, eighth grade picture, you know, for school. <laughs> That's terrible. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no. I, gave, I gave all mine away. Uh, my mom did to one of her friend's son. And I'm like, why? Just because I, because those shirts are, they're worth a lot of money as well. Yeah, mine are pretty worn out. The Nazareth that I've got, once again, is a cutoff. Sleeves are there. And it just has this white silk screen that only I know said Nazareth at one time. I remember going to that concert. <laughs> we got those tickets. And and Trey's cousin, was Shane, was supposed to drive us to Lubbock to go see Nazareth. Well, then he bailed on us. And he's, oh, I'm not going to the show. We had these tickets. So Trey's mom, Brenda, loads us up in this huge, big, long, yellow, like Lincoln Continental boat thing and drove like 100 miles an hour to love it. Got us there in time for the show, man. And uh, it, was, it was a great it was a great time. And uh, Yeah, I think I went to that concert, too. Well, Lisa? Was that Hair of the Dog, their album, Hair of the Dog? No, this would have been later on. Later on. Hair of the Dog was in the late 70s, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that was that. They were one of my favorites. So um, let's go down memory lane. At, this is going to be one of those fast. Don't think about it. Just answer. Favorite band in the eighties. Rat. Nineties. Primus. Two thousands. Oh, King, King Crimson. And now. Oh gosh, I have no favorite bands because I listen to everything. Yeah, I mean, me there's like too. no wow. music that I don't listen to. But for me, it would probably be Tommy Bolin. I always go back and listen to Tommy Bolin, either Teaser or uh, the, his Ultimate uh, Tracks um, compilation album that was put out. He died in 1976, but he's like one of my favorite gu guitarists. That, or I'd probably go back, if I'm like in a mood or something, I'll go listen to Diary of a Madman to calm down. From Ozzy Osbourne because I love Randy Rose. Nice. Were you I ever, got to were I got to see Randy and Ozzy in concert right before he died. In their oh program. wow! Yeah. Wow. Were you ever into bands like Rage Against the Machine? Love them. Yeah. Love Metallica. Them. I love Metallica. I like it. It took at first I didn't like Kill 'Em All because you know we're into that hair metal, hair metal stuff, Judas Priest, and all of a sudden all the stuff's coming out of San Francisco, all of the speed metal and all that stuff. But then by the time Ride the Lightning came around, I was like in Master of Puppets, I was all into Metallica. Yeah, I yeah. Loved, loved it. I think my family's back with tacos because the dogs are going. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have really enjoyed having you on, Curtis. I mean, wow, you have lived a very storied and interesting life. And I can't thank you enough for coming in and sharing your experiences and your love of music. I, um, just thrilled that you agreed to do this. Well, well before you leave, was, I was going to say, before you leave, uh, give us your parting words. Well, if you want to listen to any of my music, you can go to peoplescollective.com. I've got two albums up there, and there's a few pictures. So, P E O P L E S, collective.com. And uh, my parting words is uh, kind of going back to something I said earlier is like, don't have any regrets it's everything you've done up to this point in your life has made you who you are and it's just always be looking ahead and and live in the moment because you never know what tomorrow is going to bring absolutely i totally agree with that yeah so i'm all about living in this moment and i don't know why i'm doing what i'm doing right now and i mean i'll, I'll work 17 hour days and it's crazy and uh and i really don't take days off i don't think i've had a day off in a year it seems like and uh i just go 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 all the time because if i'm not working at the theater i'm trying to play music or i'm working on an appraisal thing or i'm teaching or getting a class ready and 
it's just a constant, just constantly going. And everybody's like, you're going to burn out. You're going to burn out. And I was like, I don't burn out. So I do get tired, but I just yeah. don't burn out. But so. you love what you're doing, man. That's all that matters. Yeah. It's like they say, you know, if you love what you're doing, it's not work. Um, I do have parts of some stuff that is work, but man, when it comes to music, it's just, it's what I want to do. It's all I ever wanted to do. Yeah. Pure joy. Oh, good. That's well, amidst good. your crazy schedule, we cannot thank you enough for taking time. To yes. Me. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. And, we'll and if you need me to jump in on another show sometime or something, just be sure and let me know and uh, we'll make it happen. Well, uh, let me get with Craig and maybe he can pop in, uh, like I said, the last 30 minutes because uh, that would be, it'd be cool to hear you two guys talk about the days y'all played. Well, the day that I left Lubbock, Texas, Greg flew in and uh, we went in the recording studio. I'd written this song called um, Bury Me. It, it was about that time that we buried Greg. <laughs> so I've got this heavy metal song. So I brought him into the studio and I said, here, I got this song and, and uh, I still need to get it mixed out. And then I brought him in the studio. I had my vocals on there and then got him to do some stuff. And then we just loaded up my trailer and we drove to Denver together and left Lubbock. And uh, so, yeah, Greg's been a great friend of mine for many, many, many years. And it was there for 48 hours? Buried alive. What? I bet you that's, well, pun intended, that shit stunk. <laughs> <Where'd he go? laughs> he, in the, in the, and he's kind of a tall guy, and it was only a six yeah. foot coffin. So he was kind of crunched up in there. Oh, wow. Um, but he can share stories about that. Uh, all right. Well, definitely. I'm looking forward to talking with him as well. well they, again, man, thank you, Dr. Peoples. Thank you, guys. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And, uh, May God still bless your road, the road you're on, my man. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. You're bringing a lot of joy in people's lives with music. So, absolutely. Good for you, Thank brother. You. Thank you. Okay. Oh, peace peace and love, man. Peace and love. See you. See you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Go Enjoy go. your tacos. Enjoy right. those tacos. I'll be looking forward for, this, for the uh, jingle. <laughs> That's right. The goat knuckle jingle. Let me work yes. on that. <laughs> yes. All right. Good night. Have a good one. Good night. Okay. Good Bye. night. Bye, Lisa. Bye. Bye. That was good. I oh, really did. Man, he... wow. I mean, yeah, so many things. Yeah, you know, and this is someone from Plainview, <laughs> and he's still doing it. I mean, uh, he's what uh, probably fifty-seven, fifty-eight right now, and he's still doing it strong. Good for him. Good for him. But that was funny. He tried to hitchhike, hitchhike, and he, I mean, uh, yeah, to uh, walk to Los Angeles. He only made it to Leveland. <laughs> Rich, reach out to my cousin, and we need to bring him on the show. He is a very accomplished musician. He's won numerous awards in Lubbock, and um, I'm not very close to him. I mean, I haven't seen him or talked to him in a long, I mean. Well, you know, here's an idea. Our very first show, do you remember who it was? Our very first show? Yes. Oh, my God. No, it seems like 10 years ago. It was Alex and Richard. That's music. right. Well, let's uh, – I, I, I got to look at the date when I when we aired it. Uh, I'll see if I can get Alex and Richard again and Curtis and um, your cousin. and Because we were trying to get more people for the uh, – and I'll reach out to Dan Brown again. Hopefully he will because – He's been uh, an, uh, a musician all his life, and he's actually made some Hall of Fame. So, wow, that, that would be cool. So that would be like a full circle. Get those guys back on. So, Absolutely. yeah, maybe you can work on that. Uh, get a hold of Alex and Richard, and then uh, we'll we'll uh, get with uh, Curtis as well. Yeah, and I'll and I'll re reach out to my cousin Jerry. So, awesome. anyway, it was a great another great show. Uh, we have, an, of course, we have another show in two weeks, but I don't want to mention it because we have to confirm and then st and to make sure we're still having it. Got to follow up with a certain person. So, uh, uh, but anyway, guys, Lisa, uh, thank you. And yeah, welcome back again. I'm glad you made it all in one piece, but uh, fortunately you got a little bug, uh, but you look very well. I, I uh, Pax Lovid works, let me tell you. <laughs> so anyway yeah so I'm, I'm glad to be home all in one piece it was a, an amazing and magical vacation 
um, it was utterly exhausting, but, um, you know, it's what I trained for and it was, it was a blast. Well, we, when I finally get internet, which it's, they're about to pour the foundation. So it's getting closer and closer. We'll start doing some live shows, man. We'll talk about your, your trip and I'd like to get also, uh, cash Terry back on and have him on and talk about, you know, mountain climbing and, uh, all that hiking stuff you guys do. Yeah. So anyway, well, Lisa, good night. Good night. And good night to everyone. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Peace and love, guys. Peace Don't and love. Don't forget to like us on our page. Yes. Follow and subscribe. Subscribe, uh, hit the like, and, and please post comments. So yes. thank you. Okay. Good, good night. night.